we'll get started. All right, we're recording. Uh, this is SIG apps, Kubernetes SIG apps for October 23rd, 2017. Uh, I'm Matt Farina. And so uh, here I'll share out, this is the agenda for today's meeting. Um, I just shared it in chat. And uh, before we get to our main thing and the topic, today's the 23rd, highlighted in green. And so I'll run through a few things real quick and then we'll get into demos and our discussion topic. And so the first couple of things is one, um, the announcement pod termination. Uh, we've been talking about defer containers for a little while now, um, but it appears that a lot of that conversation has paused. And now the bot is warning folks that this will be closed if we don't move forward on it. Um, so as far as I understand it, the holdup is waiting for things like reviews on the issue and reviews. There's a pull request associated with it. And so if somebody could take a minute, if you're interested in defer containers um, and give it a review, give it a once over, because if we don't do anything, it'll die on the vine. Uh, the next thing that we have up is some stuff in testing. Um, so when it comes to the flaky tests, there's two bullet items here. SIG apps is now the worst outlier. They discussed it in the community meeting a week ago. Uh, we brought it up here. And so we're looking for folks who can jump in on the job tests uh, because that appears to be where some of the flakiness is. Um, and then there's this one with network partitions and there's an issue on it. Both of them are, are here. And so if you're working on um, any of those bits, if you could take a look at it because we're now becoming the outliers and uh, I might start looking for folks specifically to go fix some of this uh, so we can clean up some of the flaky jobs and, and failed tests. And so that's it for the opening stuff. Uh, next, we have a demo for MetaController. Do we have somebody online to talk about MetaController? Yes, this is Anthony. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. And so with that, uh, the floor is yours. You can screen share. All right. Let me start. All right, can you see the screen? Yep. yep. All right, so my name is Anthony Hay. I wanted to do a demo uh, of a, a proof of concept that I'm working on called MetaController. Uh, the idea here is it's kind of analogous to uh, CRD. It builds on CRD where, you know, with CRD you kind of, it gives you a really easy interface to add uh, new custom resources and the API server will serve those for you on your behalf. You can kind of customize a little bit what it's doing now with things like based on schema validation, but the idea is whatever you want it to do on your behalf, you describe that in the uh, CRD object and it will do it for you. Uh, this is a similar thing, but for the controller side. So once you create the CRD, it's just a dumb object that sits there and stores data. Uh, what really makes it into like a full API is when you start adding a controller. And I've realized that that part also is, is uh, can use some of this, uh, uh, you know, abstraction to kind of make it easier to write new controllers. So you can think of this kind of by analogy. Um, this is trying to do for a, con a controller part what CRD did for custom resource. So to write a controller is now gonna be a more of a declarative thing that's just calls into your hook instead of having to write your own API server um, by analogy to do just put in a custom resource. So, so I don't know if that was a little too rambly, but I'll do a demo to uh, maybe to show uh, concretely what this is talking about. Um, so more concretely, the kind of modest goal here is to put an end to all feature requests filed against SIG apps. Um, to get started, I'll show an example. Um, first, I'll just talk about that this is a, a cluster add-on. You can put it in any Kubernetes cluster and you can just install it um, without having to rebuild anything. So I'm just going to apply the uh, meta controller add-on itself. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff for RBAC, but other than that, it's really just creating a couple of CRDs. Uh, there's an API called Lambda controller, another one called initializer controller. Uh, and then it's launching the pod that actually runs the meta controller itself. So the first example is what I uh, call a cat set, which is kind of a reincarnation of pet set. And this is basically a re-implementation of pet set in JavaScript. And the only reason I chose JavaScript is one to show that it can be any language uh, because this is going over a webhook. And the other reason is because 
Um, the way this works, all we're doing is passing you JSON. You make a decision on what you want to happen and you return JSON after that. So JSON in, JSON out, JavaScript is actually a really nice language for working with that. It gives you some really clean syntax. Um, if you look through this, all it's really doing is, you know, there's some stuff that fills in a pod template, kind of like if you were doing a client-side generator, except that this is going to be running on the server side in the cluster and reacting dynamically. And then at the bottom, you just have the, the actual business logic of uh, pet set or stateful set. Uh, and this is just really ported from the actual Go code, but now it's in JavaScript. So it's just doing things like put the pods in order, decide uh, you know, whether to fill things in if everything below it is ready, uh, and so on and so forth. So let me try to run this and let me show you just that it behaves like pet said. Um, this is, as you may have noticed, just like 100 lines of JavaScript. So it's not really worth building a whole image for it. I'm just going to put this into a config map. So this is just loading the sync.js into a config map. And then I'm going to install the controller. And this is just a CRD that represents your controller. Let me open up this file. Uh, you know, first you have a CRD. You would have to do this either way if you're writing a, a new controller. Um, but then what we have down here is this invocation of the new Lambda controller API that's part of my uh, project, which is saying start running this controller on my behalf, and I'll tell you some of the things that you need to know. Like this is the parent resource. These are the things that I care about as children, and it'll implement things like controller ref for you. Uh, and then this is how you talk to my hook, where I tell you the business logic of what you want to do. So let's test it out with just uh, creating an example. And this is really just a copy and paste of the stateful set example that you'll find in the docs, uh, except that I replaced the API version in kind. So other than that, it's just implementing the same stateful set API. And what we should see is, yeah, it's just kind of loading up um, similar to stateful set. And we also get PVCs so on in SIG apps, you guys know how stateful set works. Um, let's see, so I wanna do one more thing, um, which is, you know, I said this is gonna get rid of feature requests. So one feature request that we've gotten is, I wish there was a label on each pod that stateful set makes to tell me what the ordinal is. And one reason people want that is so that they can put a service per pod and have it select just that one pod and the service IP will never change. So this gives them a workaround to get stable pod IPs. So I want to go through what it looks like to make that change. Uh, so here we're just going to go to the part of uh, cat set where we're generating a new pod. Let me see if I can do this correctly in the live. We just have to convert it to string because string, uh, labels always have to be strings. I think that should be good. And then I'm going to, let's see, I forgot. Just updating the config map and then probably need to Delete the pod to. Uh, then it comes back. Let me go and delete this pod. Hopefully the controller brings that back. Oh, it has to terminate first. That might actually take a while. Okay, so that got recreated and hopefully, if I did this right,
Come on, labels. Yes, now there's a new label here. So you just went through, update a config map, and restart a controller. Now you've got a new feature that you just added. Uh, I won't go through this other example just for time, but uh, there's another one that you know, has been a feature request that's been sitting here for about over a year now. And really all it's saying is, you know, I want to have a little, my own different system of automating deployment rollouts. Um, and I have another example that you can look at in the repo here where I just went and implemented that. Uh, and this is really just taking like um, very similar API to what deployment is now. It will go and work with replica sets for you, but it just implements this different way of doing rollouts that, uh, that the user described here. Uh, so with that, I'll close up and go if there's any questions. Thank you, that was a fantastic demo. All right, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I may have totally missed it, but where was the JavaScript runtime to actually execute the config map? Uh, yeah, so that's just loading basically a Node.js Docker image and then pointing it at this uh, file that Let's see, there is a little bit of an image here. I, I, I no JS image that has a server. Uh, and this just runs, I'll serve on HTTP, read all of the request body and uh, pass it to my sync.js. And so where was that actually declared in the YAML? So in the example here, it's this deployment here. When I launched the controller, I also launched a deployment that uh, runs the webhook that, that calculates just the sync uh, state, the sync um, business logic. Thanks. So uh, this is interesting because we've been talking here a little bit about um, operators. And there's another project we've been looking at called Operator Kit. And now the, this with controllers, and it gets into kind of application management and what you can do. Um, I don't know if you've looked at operators, but is there anything you can talk to draw comparisons or contrasts between what you've got here and something like Operator Kit? Yeah, so I see Operator Kit as being kind of sort of like API server builder by analogy. Like you can make CRD or you can make your own API server. API Server Builder helps you to, if you want to go the path that gives you the full power. Uh, this is the analogy to CRD. You can use Lambda Controller or Meta Controller. Uh, if you just want a very simple thing that fits into the pattern that we can provide, um, that's, that's all you need. You just declare a resource and you're done. Uh, if you want to do, go the full operator route, then Operator Kit, I think, is a really great way to make that easier. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Can we give an example of something you can do with operator kit that you can't do with MetaController? Uh, so Brian had a sort of question that, what's an example of something that where it might make sense to do a full operator? Uh, for example, the current etcd operator, I don't think would be a great fit for this uh, MetaController pattern because it does a lot of um, managing its own state with outside of Kubernetes resources. Uh, the meta controller is really great if the kind of thing you're adapting to and from are both Kubernetes objects or Kubernetes APIs. So for example, stateful set is an example of a thing where the input is a stateful set object in the API server and the output is really just pod objects and PVC objects and those are also entities that live in the API server. Thank you for the distinction. All right, thank you. Uh, hold on. There's a question in chat. It says, you mentioned that it fakes, it watches. Are there other things that make you hesitant to use this approach in a production environment? Yes, I actually put a big warning on the repo. It's not ready for a production environment. That's uh, the faking of watches is only one, one reason. Uh, the whole thing was just, you know, really hacked up as a proof of concept. And what, uh, what's your approach from taking it from something like a proof of concept to being production grade? Yeah, the first step was just coming here and trying to see if anyone else is interested in working on this kind of project. And, and then I'm going to uh, put out a design doc soon. Okay. I look forward to seeing your design doc. I like this. All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, so the next thing up on the agenda is the discussion topic, and Brian, I see you're here, about the application definition working group and uh, what we're going to be doing there. Um, so Brian, the floor is yours, and I'll share the linked document in chat here. You ready to talk about it? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, is Antoine on? Antoine, I don't see him on. Um, oh well, go ahead and get started. So there was discussion, uh, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Um, on the SIGAPS and SIGCLI mailing lists, uh, I wrote um, kind of an overview of some history in the about thinking behind how declarative application management uh, was intended to work in Kubernetes. And there were some follow-up discussions and it was decided uh, to form a working group. Uh, just a second, I cannot share while I was sharing. Can you stop yeah, sharing? Mine's done now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so anyway, it was uh, decided to form a working group, and the I'm going to talk a little bit about the focus of the working group. It's a little bit, originally, this was, um, this presentation was scheduled before we had formed the working group, and I was pl planning to uh, explain some parts of my document. I'll still do that, but less of a focus on that and more what the application working group, uh, application definition working group uh, is going to focus on, and hopefully Antoine uh, will join so he can talk about it since he agreed to help lead the working group. Uh, yeah. Oh, you're, you're here? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let, let me, can people see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so just in terms of a little bit of background, Dozens of uh, configuration and deployment tools have been built uh, for deploying to Kubernetes. There are lots and lots of them. This list is not uh, exhaustive, but um, there's clearly a lot of need, a lot of demand, in this area. and um, existing solutions appear to not satisfy everyone. And indeed, um, there seems to be no one size fits all solution, but the belief is that there are commonalities uh, between these tools and that they could share more than they do. So you wanna um, talk about the goals of the working group, Antoine? Yeah, sure. Um, so I just seen uh, there is a lot of uh, tools in the ecosystem and there's two, two things, like it's there is a lot of opinion and there is like uh, also maybe something missing uh, upstream and the working group is uh, we're going to try to, to improve this. And by improving, um, I'm not speaking about finding like a, as an ongoing a serial bullet solution. Uh, it's just like really try to find uh, interface, uh, convention, and, and improve uh, initial primitive. So uh, I think there is, uh, we're going to explain like uh, declarative primitive, how we can improve them. Um, and before improve also, uh, a part of the working group is to understand what the actual needs, so what, why people just created so much uh, custom tools. Uh, and also through uh, the working group life, uh, we're going to prototype uh, and design proposal, and we really need uh, every one of you and people to get involved to get quick feedback. Um, and the last focus is to understand um, how we can um, interpolate uh, this application and also maybe uh, surface uh, some, some information for the user, so create some interface, and I will go back on that a little bit later. Um, and if you're interested, like the uh, brand wrote uh, a quite exhaustive background about uh, how we came here and different topics, so uh, there is a link here, and I invite you to read it. Okay, great, yeah, I'll come back around uh, to the interoperability, um, issue later, and Antoine's actually been working on something in that area. Um, okay, so I'm not, I wasn't entirely sure uh, everyone really understood what we meant by uh, declarative primitives, oh, and 
talk a, a little bit about that and why it is the way it is. Um, so by primitives, I mean the Kubernetes API itself and the mechanisms surrounding the API, including the client libraries we support, like Client Go, and uh, open API-based tools. So I don't know if everyone is aware, but Kubernetes actually uh, exposes an endpoint that um, publishes the open API schema for its API, and, and we're trying to make that uh, more complete and more accurate uh, over time. But that open API specification describes the operations that the API supports, so it can be used for discovering those operations, and it describes the schemas of all the resources in the API, pause, deployment services, uh, all the APIs that you know about. Uh, and then Kube Control, um, just because it is a client that is uh, maintained by the core project, not that it has necessarily any special status uh, other than that. Uh, eventually, I would like to get Kube Control moved out of the Kubernetes Kubernetes repository into its own repository with its own independent release cycle. Um, but there are a bunch of uh, improvements we need to make to Kube Control before that will be possible. Um, but in the meantime, we'd like to remove friction from Kube Control issues that have uh, impede declarative kind of workflows. You just, in the declarative model, users would like to be able to write their configurations in whatever syntax or schema, it doesn't matter for this conversation, they would like to write it. Basically just invoke one command uh, to make it so. And that's the only command they should have to use. Actually, uh, Anthony's demo demonstrated the power of that Kube Control apply. You just do Kube Control apply and all the resources get instantiated in the cluster whether they're built-in resources like deployment or custom resources like the uh, cat set. Uh, so that's a really powerful and simple model, especially for updates. Updates are really the killer app in some sense for declarative management. Uh, but in general, declarative, the declarative approach allows you to apply multiple operations to the same set of resources. Those resources effectively describe um, the topology of your application or your policies or whatever it is you want to instantiate and which things you want to exist or which do exist. And then that enables you to specify multiple different operations. In fact, Kube Control, you can do not only apply, but create, delete, even get. Uh, you can just specify resources by file or by name or however you want uh, and it will identify those resources and do the operation that you specified. Um, but uh, right now, there are certain changes that people want to make uh, which don't work so well with Kube Control. I didn't have time to do a demo or an example, but you know, anybody who's tried it knows you, know, you have to figure out, okay, how do I up up actually update my image? With Docker, a lot of people just want to push to the same tag again uh, and then expect that to roll out, but that doesn't that approach doesn't work so naturally with, with Kubernetes and the rollout mechanisms we provide, like rolling update. Um, so we would like to uh, smooth out some of those rough edges. Uh, Kube Control also has a number of imperative commands. Kube Control run is probably the one that people use most often, but also we saw in Anthony's demo, Kube Control create secret, or Kube Control create config map, sorry. I have both of those commands. That's probably the second most common imperative command that people use, creating a config map from some data on disk, whether it be a, a file containing environment variable mappings or, um, uh, you know, like a JavaScript for a metacontroller uh, sync loop. <clears throat> that create command is actually not declarative. It, act, it just does create, it doesn't describe the object that you want created directly. It generates that as a side effect. So one thing you can do, and Joe Vita actually wrote uh, a short blog post showing how this can work, is you can spit out the generated JSON or YAML uh, to a file. And then that gives you a resource representation that you could use with Kube Control apply. So you can actually say dash dash local dash o YAML and spit out the YAML. But there's a lot of cruft in the YAML that gets generated due to various issues with how we express, uh, express the schema in our types.go files. So everybody's probably seen 
uh, like creation timestamp null or stat empty status and resources they spit out. That just creates friction because people go and feel like they have to remove those lines by hand uh, every single time. So we should just uh, clean that up. So there, there are a bunch of things like this, which are not you know, huge bugs that are totally broken, but it just makes it less natural to use these kinds of commands and, and these kinds of ways. Um, so also, uh, control create secret, like why can't, or control create config map, why don't I have just a way of, of using that with apply directly? Um, that's a long, long standing request, basically as long as apply has existed. Um, and, you know, in order to make Q control less of a special snowflake in the, in the client world, um, you know, there's things that people feel like you can only do with Q control because they're fairly subtle and complex, apply being one of them, and I'm going to talk more about that. Uh, we need to get, move more of Kube Control's functionality actually into reusable libraries. Um, and we've done a little bit of work around that, but also into the, to the API for super, super commonly needed operations. And it, uh, one of the biggest examples of that is deployment, the deployment API. Originally, uh, we had implemented rolling update in Kube Control, mostly due to expedience. Um, but then you could only do rolling update through Kube Control and is brittle and it had another number of other disadvantages. So we actually built a controller and an API for that. Uh, and that enables all kinds of clients uh, to access that. Client libraries written in other languages like JavaScript. So you can access it from MetaController or uh, a UI or whatever it is. You can access that functionality. So we're trying to make Kube Control slimmer and slimmer uh, and use it as a way for providing kind of narrower functionality or super general purpose functionality that works with every uh, resource. Um, but kind of the heavy, heavy lifting in terms of more complex operations, we really want to get out of Kube Control and make them more widely available. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, finally, one of the issues that I mentioned that needs to be resolved in order for to move Kube Control out into an independent repository with an independent release cycle is to fix uh, forward compatibility issues. Um, and the main blocker there is just for most operations not to rely on built-in types uh, because that's not extensible. It doesn't work with uh, API aggregation or CRD. Uh, it doesn't work um, and it obstructs forward compatibility because newer fields wouldn't be represented in, even in older types. And of course, newer types wouldn't be represented either. We really want um, Kube Control just to be kind of a uh, predominantly a, a framework, a command framework, and um, generic API tool. Um, so why is Kube Control apply uh, so special and, um, and subtle? Um, well, first of all, what problem was it intended to solve? The main problem apply was intended to solve is to update declaratively managed state without clobbering non-declarative state. Like people wonder, why can't I just do a put and have and just update my spec and do a put? Why why doesn't that work? And this is really the reason why it works. It doesn't work is because it would clobber non-declarative state. Um, so, oops, uh, yeah. So what what kinds of non-declarative state would you have? Wouldn't everything just be declarative in in your configurations? So there, there are a bunch of examples. Um, Kube control supports some imperative operations, and I'm just using Kube control here as an example on the assumption that people are familiar with it, but of course you could do these uh, other ways. Uh, Kube control label or annotate you may have some information that you want to attach to resources that is not specified in your configuration files. Uh, maybe it's done operationally, like you're debugging something and you want to tag a, a pod and say, hey, I'm debugging this or something like that is not something you really want to manage through uh, declarative configuration in particular for, well, I don't want to sidetrack too much on pods, but since they're almost always generated, but um, there are a bunch of these kinds of scenarios uh, where you don't want to go through the whole flow of changing the configuration, checking it in, reapplying it. That may not even make sense, or you may have different teams responsible for managing those configurations and um, managing the operational side uh, once everything is deployed. 
Scaling is probably the most common example. Just keep control scale, horizontally scale. Um, in Docker Compose, for a long time, I, don't, I haven't looked at it recently, they didn't even have a way of specifying scale in a Compose file that was always operationally specified. Right? In Kubernetes, some people might want to specify it. Yes, this must always be five. And, and certainly that's more common for stateful applications. For state lists, often people want to scale based on load, based on other things. Sometimes they do automatically, like with horizontal pod autoscaling, in, in the future vertical pod autoscaling to set CPU and memory. Um, but even some people even just do it by hand. Like they have a diurnal cycle, so they set a cron job that just invokes cube control scale twice a day to scale up uh, during the daytime and scale back down during the evening. That's good enough for some people. Um, cube control set image is super common as part of continuous deployment. You know, you set up a build trigger, build a new container image, get the, get the digest, and then to just do cube control set image with the digest. You want to, may not want to do that through uh, the declarative configuration path because you know you'll just be continuously updating that maybe multiple times a day. And you always are going to reconstruct that from whatever the latest tag is in your image, uh, image repository. You don't need that to be also in your Git repository. Right? So that's kind of a common theme among these non-declaratively managed states is that the state is actually somewhere else or, or just derived from observation. Um, Blue-green deployments is uh, another example, the traffic shifting. Um, Anthony didn't do his demo. But uh, you know, tweaking uh, labels to shift traffic is something, if you do that during, in a controller, then you don't want that interfering with your declarative management and vice versa. Um, so there, there are a bunch of other examples, admission controllers, uh, initializers, resource allocation, you know, cluster IP and node ports. For convenience, we provide automatic allocators, but we also allow users uh, to allocate those by hand, and many people do, especially with node ports. Um, you know, so there are all these cases. Brian, are you there? Brian, I think we lost Brian's audio. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me now? Ah, yes, I can. Uh, I just had to unplug and replug the microphone. Um, yeah, so anyway, I was, I was just saying, in my experience, there's no hard line between properties you, that sometimes want, you want to manage declaratively in your configuration and check it into source control, and other times you don't want to manage it that way. You want to manage it imperatively, um, operationally, or uh, even automate, fully automate. Um, so apply is intended to handle this in a graceful manner for arbitrary attributes. <clears throat> so how does it work? Uh, apply is a three-way merge. I say think of it as a get merge. It doesn't literally work like that for various reasons, but I think that's a good way to think about it. Like you make a clone of some re Git repository, in the meantime, that Git repository, other, other commits may be merged and may be changed. You make your changes, and then you want to merge those in, and hopefully, if you're lucky, um, and you're not touching generated code or something, uh, it all merges with no conflicts, right? So that's effectively the model we want to support. There's, you previously specified some declarative configuration that created uh, or updated resources. Now you have live state. That live state may also be mutated by these other various manual or automatic processes. Uh, then you start from, not from the live state, but you start from your previous we specified declarative configured state, and you update that. And now you want to apply effectively your changes as long as they don't conflict with the live state. Now, it's not quite the same in that you actually expect the other properties you specify declaratively to also remain the same. Right, so there's, um, it's not quite the same as get merge for that reason. Uh, you actually want to assert that those other properties are the same and you probably want to detect conflicts and in some cases you want to be warned about the conflicts and in other cases you just want to stop whatever was there. Um, for example, it's common to tweak things 
uh, during debugging or firefighting and then want to make them after the fire's out, you want to make everything the way it's supposed to be again. Um, but uh, I have a little example here that's kind of simple and really everything would be simple if you just had a flat set of fields, right? But if, if you had a declarative state uh, of one field bar with the value Pokemon um, and a live states that also included another attribute, foo, with a value of five, then you want to change your declarative state bar to causality, um, and you didn't want to stop the uh, value of five for foo, right? You want to merge your change of bar in with the live state and not stomp on foo. Uh, so apply is through this three-way merge is what does that. So why is it complicated? Mostly it's complicated just because it's never had an owner or a systematic design. It just kind of evolved ad hoc and recently a new, it was re-implemented um, in order to fix that part of the problem. Uh, but also there's a lot of schema complexity because the schema wasn't really designed to do this. Even though we had in mind from the beginning um, that we wanted to be able to do it, we didn't uh, have the mechanism implemented when we started the API, so we weren't able to use that to inform uh, the evolution of the a API uh, over time. So non-positional lists is probably the number one complex thing. We have a number of lists which are effectively like maps, they're keyed lists. Uh, so uh, can the container list in the pod spec is probably the, the best example of that. The containers are identified by the container name, not by their position in the container list. So if you wanted to, for example, add another container to the list, um, you might not always want to add it to position one. It depends on where the actual containers are in the list. And actually, this complicates a lot of things because now if you want to update any property of an item in the list, you have to be able to find the right item in the list uh, in order to be able to update that. And so similarly, we have a number of sets that are generally represented as lists. Um, we have undiscriminated unions in the API. Volume sources are probably the best example of that. Um, there are, is a bunch of implicit context where multiple different uh, structures are actually the same, but they have di different sets of information populated. Object references, we have all kinds of different flavors of object references are probably those examples. So these are all the complicating factors that actually make it hard to just match up one version of a resource with, with another. Um, and be able to match up all the subparts and actually correctly determine uh, how, how to diff them or how to patch them and merge them together. Uh, so in terms of other, uh, other complications, um, and the schema complexity one is, is, is a big one, but uh, lack of API support. Um, I, the, what is the difference between merge and patch really? It's, um, and with a merge, if you're not removing any properties, like removing list elements or map elements, if, if you're just adding, it's actually fairly easy to express as a simple patch. Um, but if you are, say, removing a label or something like that, removing a map element or a list element, then there has to be some way to express that. And we didn't have a first class way of um, expressing the merge operation through the API, so a number of delete proper, uh, operations were added to um, our own custom patch flavor called strategic merge patch uh, in order to express that. But again, it was done in an ad hoc way and wasn't really thought through all the cases that needed to be supported. Um, there's a bunch of confusing defaulting behavior, especially default setting one field from values in another field or from some parts of another field uh, my favorite example is image pull policy, which is set to always if the tag on the image is latest. That's like, not only does that complicate apply, that just confuses people. <laughs> so those kinds of things we're trying to, trying to fix. For example, the uh, V1 workload APIs will not default selector from pod template labels, uh, in part for this reason, but also uh, because um, it's confusing and it's an example of this non-declarative friendly API behavior 
Like you can easily change the selector in a way that orphans the pods of a controller, right? And one could imagine ways of making that more declarative friendly, but it makes the API implementation, the controller implementation way more complicated, and it seems like it's not worth it. Um, so, and effectively labels are like names and that they identify the resources themselves and to the extent that the declarative model kind of depends on being able to figure out what the declarative configuration applies to, changing the names in between declarative operations is, is just asking for, uh, asking for trouble. Um, so anyway, um, and hopefully that gives people a better understanding of why just updating the, the declarative state is not as simple as it might seem. Um, so coming back to you know the goals of the working group, um, by now we've seen we've all seen uh, a lot of use cases of declarative configuration. Um, we hope to uh, work through some of these use cases, including some of our own um, dog food, eat our own dog food. Uh, like we have utility jobs, uh, documentation examples, uh, add-ons, and other things uh, that we can try out various approaches on. Uh, but uh, as Antoine said, as we prototype and, and work through these example examples, hopefully new mechanisms we come up with, or as we fix uh, some of the issues that we've talked about, we can actually get feedback from people on whether it's actually better or not. Um, so I'm also going to talk uh, for a few minutes. How much time do I have, Matt? Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left in the whole thing. Okay. This is the only. This is the, the this last. Is the topic. final topic. Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through some uh, what I call customization examples to inform why. There's no silver bullet or why multiple approaches. Um, people seem to want to try multiple different approaches. Uh, a lot of people think of customization in, in the context of template, what people, some people call templatization or parameterization, making it possible to instantiate a declarative configuration in multiple different ways, depending on some context. And that context might be parameter values or it might be something else. But really, the broad thing you're trying to do is take an off-the-shelf configuration and customize it for, for your needs. It's supported by almost all those tools I listed before. Um, parameterization is definitely the most common form by far, but not the only one. Um, and I have some links to some examples. OpenShift templates, um, which is what's used in the OpenShift ecosystem predominantly. Uh, Helm charts, which has been discussed a lot in the SIG. Uh, I link to a Mesosphere universe package because they also have uh, quite a large number of packages for DCOS uh, where they parameterize both the uh, marathon resources and the application configuration pretty extensively in some cases. Um, so just to show what, uh, what their approach looks like. Like you can transliterate their approach into Kubernetes. Um, that would be a possible thing to do. Uh, so, in some of them. What are some of the more common uh, reasons or scenarios where people customize configuration? By far, I've looked at lots, hundreds of configurations. By far, the overwhelming majority of uh, customization cases are people just customizing the effectively the names of the things they're instantiating. Uh, virtually every off-the-shelf configuration supports that. Um, usually it's done through explicit parameterization, like you put the name um, of the package as a prefix on all of the resources. Kubernetes also supports other tagging resources with other identifying information through labels. Uh, so that's really common in Kubernetes, specifically. Um, cu customizing identity, uh, in some cases, is common as well. Um, but that's by far the overwhelming uh, majority. For ge more generic templates, like just starting up uh, Nginx or even just a service and deployment, those kinds of things, it's pretty common to customize things like the command line arguments, environment variables, and config files. Um, resource parameters 
are super common, like CPU memory, number of replicas, um, the image or image tag, those kinds of things. There are other properties are less commonly uh, customized. In Kubernetes, things that are more part of the operational environment, uh, like security policy, and those types of things are often people want to customize not in their declarative configuration because they're more operator concerns that are different depending on the environment in which you deploy it, but they want to specify it out of band through some other mechanism like uh, admission control is, is a common one we support, limit range, uh, pod security policy, and now with admission control extension, you can use that to inject all kinds of operational configurations, scheduling constraints, whatever it is. And that's another case where you need to merge the declaratively managed state and um, some, some non-declaratively managed state. Uh, so yeah, so just talking about basic strategies. I'm for a long time in Kubernetes, we've um, just written out the, the raw literal YAML for the API resources. And that's simple and it helps teach the API, the Kubernetes API. Um, and it's also pretty easy to fork. If you want to customize it, you can just, you know, even just copy paste the example and customize it to your needs. Literally forking is useful if you want to be able to rebase um, and, and get pick up changes from the original and use tools you're familiar with for looking at the diffs and resolving conflicts. Um, and if you only need to stamp out one, uh, one version of that application, it's a pretty natural and straightforward thing to do. Um, another approach, which is not super commonly used in uh, Kubernetes space so far, is patching. Um, KPM, Antoine's KPM actually supported a version of this a while back around the time that Helm was getting started. Um, and it's something that we're exploring, ex exploring now. Um, but patching enables, uh, makes it straightforward to potentially instantiate multiple different instances or to combine multiple different patches together in the same resource. Uh, so there are a bunch of other techniques that you can use, but my main point, uh, and I put parameterization at the bottom, I already mentioned that one, uh, is that there are more approaches than just parameterization that people can use uh, to customize off-the-shelf configurations. Uh, within Google, we've tried lots and lots of different approaches. Uh, lots of custom configuration DSLs, Python-based domain-specific languages for configuration, uh, one interesting pattern is that people want to build automation on top of the basic orchestration mechanisms and on top of uh, other transformations that are done in the configuration system. We built up this huge configuration ecosystem inside of Google, and then people want to build automation on top of it, and they figure out that, well, it's not really possible to build uh, automation on top of the general uh, configuration languages, so then they build a data, data model over a restricted subset of uh, the configuration language in order to leverage the tooling beneath that, right? So effectively, they're building an API or a data model on top of that declarative stack just to reuse all that code, which is written in some funky language. Um, so that's one reason why I feel like anchoring declarative management around the actual APIs or custom resources like with CRDs is a good way to go because I always see people gravitating back towards that. And uh, I don't know if people saw the, um, there's an old blog post from a few years ago, the configuration complexity clock that goes around from hard coding everything to making everything a parameter to writing some custom rules language to writing a Turing complete DSL and then back around to hard coding everything. Um, I'll dig up the, the link again and drop it somewhere, but uh, that, I, that really resonated with me. I've really seen that clock go round and round and round many times over the past decade. Um, but um, uh, anyway, yeah, so coming back to interoperable building blocks, I think you know there are a lot of commonalities, um, common needs between the different tools, um, existing tools, you know, it's pretty easy to just run set or infsubst or something like that to do some basic parameterization. These tools are, a lot of them 
since people built them themselves, were focused on what's easy to build versus what's easy to use. Uh, but as a consequence, they hide information from other tools. For example, the parameters are typically not discoverable. If you want to build a UI or a form generator or validation tool or documentation or something like that on top of it. Um, the, uh, or even just being able to find off-the-shelf applications and pull them down locally so that you can then uh, deploy those. That's a basic thing that you need, regardless of what syntax you wrote your configuration in. Um, so here's just an example of uh, a Helm chart where basically every line was parameterized. Uh, I think there are better ways to solve scenarios like this than just parameterization. So if Helm supported, uh, just as one example, other ways to customize configurations and other schemas and things like that, then people could use all the rest of Helm and use a, a more uh, suitable solution to this particular problem. So what are these overlapping concerns? Uh, Antoine, do you wanna talk about this a little bit since this year and maybe talk about what you're working on? Uh, yeah, so <laughs> we're trying to find like uh, different uh, concerns we can uh, work on. Uh, one of them is uh, application metadata. So some tools have uh, metadata uh, like HEM, uh, the chart.html, some uh, doesn't have, and they all, every package does require more or less the same set of information. So we can just maybe uh, agree on that and and then think about tools to, to leverage uh, this information across, across tools. So uh, I will probably do a demo about that um, next week or following weeks. Um, I say parameter schema, I think it's very interesting. Um, it's, I say this like uh, a little bit like um, ingresses uh, for load balancer. So ingress by itself doesn't do anything, uh, but it's a contract uh, between the user and the load balancer. And I would like to see uh, such things uh, between uh, on application. So as a user, we'll have a consistent experience of what they want to do, regardless about the, the format they're going to to use it could be a JSONet or code template or whatever. As a user, I should try to to get the same experience and uh, yeah. So maybe uh, think about parameter uh, schema and can be very useful also also for also tools like uh, dashboard to create a formula etc. Um, yeah. So we're going to think a little bit about uh, each each step of uh, application lifecycle and what's going to be the input and the output, and if we can uh, find uh, a, a common, uh, common convention and, and specify some interface, so we could, uh, could interface them together. Um, that is so, yeah, I will, I will, I will follow up uh, with demo, uh, I said, uh, for each different kind of, each part uh, with prototype and... Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so I, I, oh, go ahead, Brian. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to reemphasize. So Antoine, for people who don't know, is working on uh, App Registry, which already um, supports multiple different configuration schemas and it needs the common resource metadata, basically the same information that's in chart.yaml, right? So that's kind of a, the proof of the concept that uh, common information could be used across multiple different tools. So, so uh, because we've only got a few minutes left here, I wanted to jump in and, and point out a couple of other things. Uh, one thing that I didn't see in this deck is user experience or developer experience. Because, you know, when it comes to developers who actually have to consume some of these things that we might break out of kube control or that we need, what's the experience like for them? And how do we know that it meets their needs and, and the use cases and the problems they're bumping into? Uh, there are a lot of opinions that were in here. But do they actually meet the needs? Because, you know, we've got, I see we've still got 32 connections to this call. And so we've got a whole bunch of people who are building and using and dealing with operating applications today. And so one of the things that we're tasked with in this working group is actually collecting what problems are you running into now? You know, where are you seeing roadblocks with your tools today? So that way we can take and listen and not just have opinions on go forth and do it this way or that way. But actually, you know, there are a bunch of tools out there with different ways of doing things, some good, some bad, and different people having opinions on what's good and bad and why. And so, and, and then there's roadblocks that you run into like, I can't find a way to easily do this or doing something this way ends up being a lot of extra work and, and it's a pain to do. Um, or this way has these pitfalls where I might end 
up screwing something up because I changed it in two places and not the five places it needs to be changed. Uh, there's different things like that that we're going to run into. And so if you have stuff like that feedback you want to give, uh, you can either send it to me, uh, Matt Farina, or you can come to the working group and share it with us. Um, one of the things that hopefully we'll end up doing is coming up with a nice way to collect some of that. Because even though there's a lot of opinions here, we need to make sure that we listen and we solve real problems. Because if we don't do that, then we're going to build another thing that's just, you know, um, a, another standard along in the way of standards. And it doesn't necessarily make things better than it was before. It just makes them different. And yeah, so we've we, we got to be careful that we do that. Yeah, I want to reemphasize um, something that was mentioned earlier, which uh, Antoine mentioned, which is we're not looking to make a standard. We're not looking for a silver bullet. We're just trying to improve mm -hmm. uh, the situation. <laughs> Yeah. So, so uh, as Gareth, uh, as a user and builder of a bunch of tools on top of like the Kubernetes ecosystem, like how I took what this is and this why I'm interested is that it's both lowering the barrier to entry for people building higher level tools at the same time as improving the interoperability of those tools. And yeah. I think it's it's actually those tools, i.e., anything that's built on top, that big list up front where a lot of the actual user experience issues are and that they're actually out there trying to solve. But as someone who's built a few things there, like um, if you build two, you end up, uh, especially in two different languages, you end up solving some an annoying problems um, and then working around like bits that are basically hard coded in kubectl, not in the APIs and making that both easier to do, cutting out a bunch of, I think if we do this right, um, all of the people who've built any tools in that list can delete 20% of their code. That would be a sort of success. Um, it, it, and at the same time, be more interoperable. Um, and I think then that prevents locking into the tools that people are building on top. And that allows people to move with them. Does that make sense to the people who've sort of been formulating the working group? That was my sort of take on it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, Gary. All right. Well, it is now wrap up time in, in a few. Oh, there it is. Uh, meetings up. Lots of us have other places to go. So uh, thank you everyone for coming. Those of you who are interested in the working group, I want to say the, the first one is a week from Wednesday. Um, and so look out for details. Um, there is in the community repo, there is a working group page where you'll be able to find the details once they're all posted, once we have them. Antoine, did you want to add something? Uh, yes, I, I will send an email uh, later uh, today with uh, the agenda and, and the Zoom link so you can join. Um, Fantastic. Thank you. All right, folks, then I'm going to hit stop on recording.